This is Umar Ahmed for IFL TV, proudly sponsored by Everlast. Is this our first interview with Dan Raphael in 2022? Or is that wrong? I think it is, Umar, I believe. I, I think I was with uh, one of your other uh, colleagues, but I think you and me, first time this year. So yeah. happy new year, if that's uh, not too, uh, too late to say. Well, first time I spoke to you properly this year, so we can say happy new year. Um, it's right. still, still January. Uh, Dan, of course, uh, the internet broke last night in terms of the boxing world when um, we learned that there's actually some concrete news in the heavyweight division. Um, Frank Warren's Queensbury promotions won the purse bid for Fury White at a whopping $41 million. Uh, what was your initial reaction when you saw that? Holy shit, that's a lot of money for a purse bid. And then when I started to like do a little research and look some stuff up and things that came to my mind of other big fights that had went to purse bids, uh, you know, it turns out not only was Frank's bid, uh, with which won it for forty one million, the largest bid ever offered in the history of purse bids. But Eddie Hearn's uh, second place bid, which was like 32.2 million and change, was the second largest purse bid ever offered. It, they both were larger than the previous record, which uh, according to what I was able to find out and look up, was you got to go all the way back to 1990 when main events um, uh, and, and Mirage, the casino in, in Las Vegas, were both bidding for the, the promotion rights to the heavyweight title fight between Buster Douglas coming off the victory over Mike Tyson and his mandatory defense against Evander Holyfield, and the Mirage won that purse bid for $32.1 million. Now, of course, if you translate $32.1 million into today's uh, uh, money, it's, it's millions and millions of dollars more in terms of inflation and all, but it's still, uh, it taken, it's taken a long time to, uh, to surpass that bid. There was one a few years ago, which is the first one I had thought of, which was when uh, the Russian promoters won a purse bid for Vlad Vladimir Klitschko's uh, mandatory against Alexander Povetkin, which was around 19 million and change. But uh, the purse bids uh, the other day for, for uh, Fury and White, both of the, the bids just dwarf that as well as the all-time record. What kind of price level did you expect the bids to be at beforehand? I mean, 30 million, it seemed like, a pretty big number to me when I, you know, I hadn't really, to be honest, I hadn't like thought about the particulars, but when you just, just quickly in your mind, just sort of run through the laundry list of the money of what you think it might be. Again, I'm not the one with the official financials of the particular about what the costs are um, that seemed in the ballpark. But when I started thinking about it after I saw the 41 million and talked to a few people that are involved and others that know the business, obviously extremely well, you know, that 41 million, while no slam dunk is, is, a, is a number where they probably will all be able to make money. I mean, it's very obvious that if you do the math on the split, that you have the fighters each come for a certain amount and they're, they're going to be getting, uh, you know, the, all of that 41 million, although the 10% the of that money goes to the winner as, as a bonus. But nonetheless, Tyson Fury would have a set number based on the percentage. Um, while neither neither uh, camp will say it in terms of Frank or top rank, it's very obvious that they got Tyson to agree to a figure that is something less than what that split would be, which would make sense. It's not a knock on the promoters or on Fury. What they did was work out a business arrangement so they can make sure that their side got the bid. They can control it. They can put it where they want to put it. They can, you know, be the ones to uh, to put together the event. Um, but even even at the number that's the that's that would be what the official number would be based on the the purse uh, bid, they can do very well. I mean, you know, I was figuring, you know, the you know, we don't know the exact location. I mean, I suspect it's going to be obviously one of the big stadiums in the UK, Cardiff or Wembley or whatever. Uh, Cardiff is sort of the one that's making the rounds right now. You know, they'll do probably like in the eight million dollar range in terms of tickets, maybe a little bit more. Uh, an American pay-per-view, remember, it would be on uh, in the late afternoon, early evening in the United States, East Coast, uh, because of the time difference. You know, if they could do 200,000 buys on pay-per-view, remember, this is not a mega fight to the United States audience. Uh, you know, you're talking about another, you know, eight or nine million out of the pay-per-view that they would get to keep. You have obviously a huge pay-per-view event in the UK. You have all the rest of the international markets where they'll uh, sell the, sell the, uh, the rights. You have all the, the sponsors that are going to flow into a big fight like this. I mean, they'll sell a million dollars in T-shirts. In other words, if you add up all those streams of money, you should be able to hit your 41 million with no problem and, and still make and still be able to have everybody else involved besides the fighters, meaning 
the promoters. And keep in mind also, you have to talk about expenses for an event like this. You know, it's been esti estimated to me that the expenses, and that's all the things that go into it, everything from, you know, uh, feeding the staff to, to travel, to hotels, to undercard expenses, et cetera, press conferences, you know, probably another three, $4 million all in. Um, but it's a big event. It's gonna do huge numbers on pay-per-view in the UK. It will do okay in the United States. It'll have a lot of ticket sales. It'll be sold in every market around the country, around the world rather, because it's a big heavyweight title fight and they'll sell a lot of t-shirts and, and that sort of stuff. And uh, you know, we got a big heavyweight fight. Yeah, I agree with you. I think somewhere in the region of 150K and 200K buyers on ESPN pay-per-view seems reasonable in the States. Um, and to, to make up that figure of 41 million or even make a bit of a profit on it, I think I've spoke to a lot of people and they're saying on BT Sport Box Office it needs to do around the 900K, maybe even a million buyers. Do you think it's capable of doing that? I certainly don't know the UK market as well as you do. But when I hear from lots of people that know it well, and they talk about some of the Anthony Joshua fights that they exceeded a million buys or going back a few years before that, uh, fights that involved Ricky Hatton that exceeded that number. I see no reason why Tyson Fury, the number one heavyweight on the planet, uh, with that kind of personality coming off the 2021 fight of the year, uh, combining with a fighter like Dillian White, who has been able to headline his own pay-per-views on Sky Sports box office and done fairly well and fought lots of terrific fights and against a lot of top opponents. You put the two of them together and the way they'll talk with each other and, and get the British public revved up for uh, that fight. I, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't have the same kind of uh, marketability as any of those other fights that we mentioned as, as far as it is uh, compared to a Joshua fight or, or, um, or Ricky Hatton or, or, or other fights that have been on pay-per-view in the UK, even fights that didn't necessarily involve Brits like Floyd Mayweather fights and that sort of thing. And just the last one on the purse bids, going into it again beforehand, did you expect this outcome? Did you expect Team Fury side to win it? Oh, definitely. I expected Team Fury side to win. I didn't know how they were going to do it, if it was going to be officially Frank Warren. I mean, obviously, Frank's bid is in conjunction with Top Rank. That's why Top Rank didn't place its own bid. If Top Rank had made a bid, you wouldn't have seen a bid from Queensberry. But I think it was mainly because Queensberry is the British-based promoter. The fight's going to be in Britain. Uh, they're going to take the lead on the logistics and all on the event, but certainly top rank is uh, heavily involved in, in formulating and figuring out what to bid. So it did not surprise me uh, that they had, to, and Bob Aaron made a very good point to me. He said, you know, Eddie Hearn, they did a, you know, he was complimentary of, of, uh, of what the other side did, uh, the 31 million and change or 32 million and change. And, you know, that was done with, you know, they discussed these things with their, with their broadcasters who are clearly ones that back these types of events. And that was something that does, you know, this is Bob speaking that the zone, which is the broadcaster that puts on Eddie's events was comfortable with that number. He said, Eddie had one broadcast backer. We have two. And he means in the United States, they have the ESPN backing and in Britain, they have the backing from BT. So it felt like from when he said that, I, I realized to myself, there was probably almost no way that they could lose the bid. They didn't just win by the skin of their teeth. They won by almost $10 million. So uh, they could have been quite. They could have bid much, much less and still come out on top. Um, but, but the, but the white side, they put on a, you know, when your, when your second place losing bid is still the second greatest bid in the history of purse bids. You know, you've done right by your side. And you know, listen, it just shows you that at the top level in boxing, which is an open market, and whoever wants to bid the fight, as long as they're a registered promoter and you feel like you have a big event, uh, boxing is still where the money is compared to other combat sports. Um, and uh, Dylan White, you know, I don't know what the outcome of his arbitration with the WBC is going to be, but he's going to make at least $7 million and change. Tyson Fury is going to make at least 20, 20 uh, well, whatever his deal is with, with Frank and, uh, and Bob, but north of $20 million, obviously. And then, you know, the winner of the fight, I kind of like the WBC role. I kind of forgot about it at first when I was calculating the numbers. Uh, for those who don't are not familiar with it, what the WBC does in terms of purse bids is whatever the winning bid is, 10% comes off the top. So if you bid, you know, uh, uh, ten million dollars on a fight, all you know, a million dollars right off the bat comes out of that, and it goes to the WBC to hold. And when the fight's over, that money is given to the winner of the fight. So you know, you get your your minimum based on the split, which is really 90% of the money, and the other is a bonus. So the winner of Fury versus uh, um, of white is going to receive on top of their actual purse uh, another four million point one four point one million dollars. So if you're Dillian White, for example, and you know you're getting seven million and change, 
and you win the biggest fight of your life, you get a bonus of another four million and change. That's a lot of money on top of a base purse of seven million dollars. Absolutely is, and that sets a, a clearer path uh, in the division. You know, hopefully White doesn't pull out this fight in terms of the purse bid situation that goes ahead. I think it will, and then we're going to get Usyk Joshua back in the ring again. And there's no rematch clauses in either of these fights. That's it. We're all done. And the winners of each one, hopefully, land in an undisputed fight, probably end of the year in Saudi Arabia. Do you read it like that as well, Dan? I can't say specific about the site, but uh, I think that's an accurate portrayal. I asked Bob that exact question when I spoke to him, and he spoke about that uh, that, that would be the intention. Um, like you said, there will be no mandatories uh, to deal with. You know, the mandatory situations for each organization are going to be, you know, the WBC is not going to give any issues. This is their mandatory. So they're fine. Um, the WBA has their own stuff to settle. They're going to let the dust clear from uh, their, their, their secondary fights that are going on before they actually make them fight each other, uh, the, meaning their regular champion and whoever the super champion is. So the WBA is not going to be an issue. Um, the IBF is not due yet. And the WBO, and even if the, even if the IBF was due, um, it's well within their rules for them to apply for a, an exception to that rule as long, you know, in a unification fight. So they, the promoters would do that and the IBF would not give them any, any flack whatsoever. And uh, in terms of the WBO it would be a similar situation. They're not going to stand in the way of this type of fight, you know, as long as it's happening within a reasonable time frame. And I think anybody that knows boxing would say that by the end of 2022 uh, is certainly a reasonable time frame. So uh, again, there's a long way from our conversation about what could happen to the, the winners of these two fights actually getting into the boxing ring and settling the, the status of who's the undisputed champion. And, and we've been here before, but it looks, I'm not gonna get my hopes up. You know me a long time. Uh, I don't get too pumped up until I see it signed, still delivered. But I would say I'm optimistic that, it, that, it, that the winner, particularly if it's Joshua and Fury, no, no knock on those other fighters, but that's the biggest of the possible permutations of these outcomes and that's a really big fight obviously and uh it, it feels like both sides would want it fury i don't think fears anybody joshua i don't think fears anybody they know it's a huge fight the money on the table for that kind of event is astronomical um you know both guys win or lose could walk away and never have to fight again they already could given what they've already earned and uh you know that that's a that's a big fight and it would feel it would feel like after all the fights that have taken place, you know, the, the Joshua saga of his losses and wins and the other top guys he's fought, you know, the fury back and forth with Deontay Wilder, what would happen in these two fights? Um, you know, it's like an era defining event when they finally meet. Mm. Yeah. Dan, we know that um, it's extremely likely April in a UK stadium, Cardiff, as you said, for Fury White. What's your current understanding of a month and a venue for Usyk Joshua too? That's a really good question. I was thinking about that when I was writing uh, on my newsletter yesterday about the outcome of the purse bid for Fury and White. Because if you've listened to any of the things that Eddie Hearn has said and the people that have been around uh, the discussions for, you know, not the discussions because they have a contract, you know, because of the rematch clause, but in terms of when they would situate it, it's always pretty much been stated by Eddie late April. Well, they're not going to be in late April because they're not going to put a, a, a big giant rematch of Anthony Joshua, which would also be on pay-per-view in Britain uh, in the same month or the same weekend or the same two weeks of Fury versus uh, uh, Dillian White. So, and I don't think you can, they're not going to move up the schedule. I don't think. In other words, it's not like they were thinking April and now they're going to suddenly go in March. I think the reality is that fight probably gets pushed back. Uh, again, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm just using my, my, my knowledge of covering these things and sort of the, the boxing calendar, it, feel, it feels like that probably winds up in May, possibly even into, I would say maybe your best bet if you were going to like wager, well, I'd say like that early June. And I say that also because there's a good possibility that Eddie may be involved in the next Canelo Alvarez fight, which would probably be in early May. And again, you know, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, it's unusual for there to be two really big mega events in the same month so if it fell out the way it feels like it might you would be talking about Fury's defense against white in that late april date april 23rd canelo sometime in may obviously he usually likes to fight on the cinco de mayo weekend 
Uh, and they have talked about him possibly being in June also. Eddie Reynoso said that. But if he stays in May, that would clear the path for, you know, the big heavyweight fight between Joshua and Usyk, their rematch to take place perhaps in early June. I mean, that's that's sort of how I just read the tea leaves. Could that be, you know, could the could the other two dates change other than the than the than the Fury White fight? Yeah, but it feels like what I just said to you would be the logical um, calendar. Well, that that reads well. Fury White in April, Canelo v whoever in May, and then Usyk Joshua in June. That's not a a bad kind of first half of twenty twenty. That's a lot of fun. It's a good schedule, right? Yeah, definitely is. Dan, listen, appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully see you across the pond very soon. And yeah, we'll catch up soon. All right, take care. All right, appreciate it, my man. Take care.